Good morning, everyone. I think we still have a few more attendees trickling in, but I just wanted to welcome everyone that's here to today's flame working demo with Stephen Brucker. Uh, this is our first virtual program in our M&T Bank Clothesline Online Festival. This festival has been the Memorial Art Gallery's largest fundraiser for more than 60 years. And although we've had to go virtual this year, our goals are still the same. We want to highlight and support the arts and our artists. Thank you all for being members at the MAG. We're incredibly grateful for all that you're doing to support us, especially in this great time of need. Your support makes what we're able to do possible. You help us bring incredible art and artists to Rochester, build breathtaking exhibitions and make art accessible to all. I just wanted to mention a few brief housekeeping items before we start today. We do have a live captioner with us today. So if you would like captions on your screen, you can click the closed captioning CC button at the bottom of your screen. After today's demonstration, we'll also have some time set aside for any questions that you've submitted. So please submit your questions for Stephen throughout the presentation at any time by clicking the Q&A Q button at the bottom of your screen. And then at the end of today, we will, your browser should take you to a short survey about your experience with us. So let us know what you think. Um, so now it's my pleasure to introduce Stephen Brucker, our presenter for this morning. Stephen is the manager of the special projects team at the studio where he manages the artist in residence group glassmaking and at risk youth programs. He received his MFA in 2012 from the Rochester Institute of Technology and his BFA from SUNY Oswego in 2005. He operates his flameworking studio in Camillus, New York, and he exhibits his work throughout the Northeast. He's been selected as an award recipient in both nationally and internationally jury exhibitions. His borosilicate glass sculptures are centered on the combinations of forms and structures found in nature and are aligned with themes signifying home, inclusion, and equity. Fragility, transparency, balance, and impermanence are core conceptual topics that he explores in each of his sculptures. He was also in our 66th Finger Lakes exhibition last fall. Um, so you probably remember his beautiful glass tree sculptures, which were encased under glass domes. So Stephen, I'm gonna pass off to you now so you can tell us about what you'll be showing us today. And I'll ask you some questions throughout your demonstration. Thank you, Bella. I, I just wanna say it's been a pleasure and, a, and an honor to be asked and invited to participate today. I also want to provide a quick brief shout out to Amy Schwartz, the director of the studio, who's allowed me to utilize the recording facilities for this demonstration. So thank you. Uh, today, I'm going to be making a hollow or blown acorn ornament uh, using borosilicate glass. And uh, I have a couple of different components already pre-made. Um, and I generally will use borosilicate glass. There are many, many types of glass, but I enjoy using the borosilicate. You will have this product in your house known as Pyrex. So there is a, a great deal of permanence to this material. There's a great deal of flexibility with this material. It's uh, durable. And my goal with it is to make it look as delicate and fragile as possible with the understanding that it is a pretty strong and durable material. So uh, this, will probably take about 45 minutes. There are two to three oak leaves that will be uh, manipulated. I'm going to try to bring that really, really close. And you can see that they're transparent and opaque, as well as uh, the blown acorn pieces as well. And because we're wearing masks here at the studio, I did have to make the blown acorn prior to. It's really difficult. You can't really blow glass through a mask. So I'm going to dive in. Uh, I want to tell you, first of all, this is a propane and oxygen torch. So it does produce a flame of about 4,000 degrees. In order to see through that and reduce solar flare, I'm going to put these adenium glasses on. Uh, that will allow me to see directly into the fire without seeing all the orange glow. And I'll do my best to keep working in and out so you can see exactly uh, where I am and what's happening in the process. So although the, this torch is one of the uh, hottest things in our studio, again, 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit, because it does have a lot of oxygen, it's pushing that heat away. So it will allow us to bring our hands relatively close without having any danger of being burned. So I'm just dialing it into the appropriate temperature. I'm gonna start by creating the branch, the branches of the ornament. 
take a short amount of time. One of the nicest things about working with this uh, material is that it allows you to put it directly in the flame. There's no pre-warming necessary, as it is great at resisting thermal shock. And you can heat it up, manipulate it, set it on the table, put it back in the fire if you need to. It has a great uh, resiliency. And that is not common with soda lime glass or other types of glass. So this is the main stem or the main branch. So there are three major steps. Heat the glass, wait, and then manipulate. So I often will tell myself, heat, wait, manipulate. So this is a waiting stage. Now we're just gonna pull and shape it into the direction. I'm gonna cut that free. Add a second branch to the first. The glass itself does have to reach a temperature of 1,700 degrees before it'll move or become the consistency of caramel. And that's why uh, propane is required. If you utilized natural gas, you would not get a heat temperature that's high enough to melt the glass. I'm just fusing these two together. And creating enough heat here to create a second branch. I'm sure, it, I'm sure it takes a lot of practice to figure out how to get it to make that specific curve with the glass. Would you, would you agree with that? It, it takes a lot of getting back on the horse. <laughs> I think, um, yeah, it, it is a period of time of where you think about it, attempt it. Generally, it doesn't work the first time. Uh, so then it's an assessment of what, well, what worked, what didn't work and then going back in and then trying it again. Uh, this particular design took about three and a half months uh, to get it to a point where it can, it can be made within 45 minutes. Wow, that's a lot of practice. And you're making it look very easy. I feel like I could step into the studio and <laughs> I could be able to do it too, right? <laughs> yes. If, yeah. Well, I say everyone can. You just have to, again, have the determination and the, the patience with yourself to say, okay, this is possible. If it takes 200 times, great. <clears throat> we have to start somewhere, right? Right. But we'll get there. So when did you start working with glass as a medium? I started in 2005 was the first time that I actually touched glass. I had been working in, as a sculptor in various metals and I was, I'm fascinated with the process of casting. So I was making sculptures in aluminum and <clears throat> bronze, eventually casting in iron um, and then moving towards more uh, more softer material, casting in plaster, casting in paper. Um, and although I loved the, the process, I really didn't like the result because it was mostly creating these, these objects which were dark and heavy and kind of, in my, my understanding, lifeless. And so I really started to, to say, okay, there must be something else. If I'm gonna continue, um, I have to find something else. So, 
I, I attended, I went to a graduate exhibition at the Rochester Institute of Technology. And that was the first time that I had seen glass being manipulated uh, in a way that was a sculptural fashion. I'm just making a loop here at the top, which is gonna be how the ornament's gonna be suspended. And it also is gonna be a branch. And so after attending that, that exhibition, I, I was committed and uh, I literally wrote to the university and said I have absolutely zero <laughs> experience working with glass, but I have, to, I have to do my graduate program at your university. And they, I thought for sure they would reject me. And they, you know, I said, I don't care what I have to do. If it's five additional years, um, I'm, I'm, I'm down for it. You tell me what I'm doing. And they were like, well, we took a look at your portfolio and you will have to do, you know, maybe an additional year, uh, but based on how you wrote this application, we, we're going to take you. I like jumped out of my seat <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> and uh, not looking back soon. That's, that's really interesting. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm a little bit surprised that you actually started with sculpting and other mediums and then moved to glass. Um, that's really cool. We do have a question from Mindy in the audience today. She's wondering, do you start with drawings or sketches before you create one of your works? Yes, oftentimes I do. Um, but what I'll also do, I'm just going to put this into a kiln just to keep it warm uh, so it doesn't crack. It really shouldn't, be, but for today, I'm not going to take any chances with that. Um, oftentimes what I'll do, Mindy, is simply to um, sketch out the process um, of, of creating it um, or where I think I'll have technical difficulties. I will map that out. And then a lot of it is what I call visual sketching. So sitting at the torch, taking into consideration where I think I want it to go, and then giving it a shot. Okay, so I'm going to start on these uh, oak leaves. So I'm heating up maybe a half an inch, and this is the ultimate in heat, weight, manipulate. So I've heated it, I'm waiting. You're going to see it change a little bit. I'm going to pull it and then just give it a gentle push to get that curve. And that articulation, I think, adds a little bit of life to the design. So I'm going to take two different colors. This is a color called Triple Passion. It is a borosilicate color. It has an interesting quality. This is a, <clears throat> a reactive color, which essentially means um, that depending on the amount of oxygen in the flame, this color will change. So I'm going to heat it and add it in two lines on the exterior of my center to give it the body of the leaf. And I love that little space in between, that little hole in it. I'm going to take another color, which is also a reactive color, and this is called amber purple. <clears throat> I'm going to put four nodes on the sides here. The key is when we're adding glass to an existing part of the sculpture, we have to do it in the flame in order for it to, to bond. If not, we would have an attachment which is called a cold attachment. But if there's any type of vibration at any time through the history and life of this piece, that vibration will cause it to pop apart, break. So we are adding this in what we call hot or fused connections. Both pieces glowing white hot and then we touch them together. Last one. Okay. So now that I have those on there, I'm going to take these mashing pliers. Right? They're two discs, or two, excuse me, two square pieces attached, and they're going to flatten themselves. I'm going to keep them to their glowing white hot. Let's insert them. 
given a gentle squeeze, and that flattens out a large portion. You can do that all around. Because I'm using a high amount of oxygen in the plane, this class is going to be almost transparent. You can see those nodes are really very clear. But that will change when we reduce the oxygen in the final step, and you're really quite amazing. I like these colors because they really talk to me about the understanding of fall and uh, the fact that they remain transparent. Okay. It's also pretty magical. So we have basically a standard oak leaf shape, eh, give or take. But now we're gonna articulate it a little bit more and give it a lot of light. So to do that, I'm gonna turn down the gas and my flame is going to become really, really pinpointed. I'm going to take these thin, very thin thread. Glass. We call these stringers. And essentially, I've just taken a larger rod of glass and pulled it very thin. I'm going to heat up just the upper portion here, lay my stringer down, lift it up, and it's going to articulate and give that a thin outline. It's also going to give it a really beautiful point. Now I'm going to lay it on here, heat it together, take it out, and then just lift it up. It gives this layer. I'm going to do that at each one of these points. That's going to allow our oak leaf to actually become a lot more interesting, in my opinion. So I'm drawing on some veining here, heating the whole thing, waiting a second or two, and then just gently pulling it into shape. the bottom. And now to the other side. A little bit of excess here that we don't need. Remove that. When you're holding the threader piece while you're adding those elements, does does the piece of glass get hot in your hand if you have it in front of the flame for too long? A great question. Uh, and the answer is no, the immediate answer is no, but that's primarily because glass is a really poor conductor of heat. So hang on to it uh, here, and there's really no residual heat that's coming off of it. That's one of the other things that I really like about it. I, I often say I'm the world's least patient Glass maker. My assistant Jason, who's back, is laughing. He's just off the screen, but he knows this because we worked together for years uh, and he knows this is the truth. Um, but this immediacy to grab onto it, the, you know, the borosilicate glass, immediately place it into the fire, manipulate it, throw it on the table, come back to it when you're ready. That, that's right up my alley. <laughs> that speaks of worlds to me. Um, I'm going to clean this up a little bit. So we have a an articulated oak leaf. So we wow. have these areas that are transparent and some areas that are opaque. And now what we're gonna do, I'm gonna turn up the propane on the torch and I'm also gonna turn down the oxygen and you're gonna see there's a yellow portion coming into the flame, maybe it's a little too high. And so what we're doing now, this is called a reduction or reducing flame. And because I understand these glass elements, and essentially it's the, the metals within the glass, will respond to different temperatures of heat by reducing the oxygen, see the whole thing glow, and these colors are going to change into much deeper autumnal tones. And this took quite a while to, to understand the chemistry, how to change it. I'm also going to do a little shaping. Put that in the 
So you can now see that those colors have changed significantly within the flame. Wow. So the flame is changing the color of the glass. Wow. Yeah. It's changing the chemistry and the reaction within the metals, which cause the color in the, in the glass. Wow. Right? This is why it's like an incredible material. I'm like, iron doesn't do that. <laughs> You'd have to apply patinas over time. I'm gonna do one more of these really quickly. For us, I have some other ones, and then we'll get into the, the shaping of the, the acorn as well. So how many colors can borosilicate glass change depending on the heat of the flame? Is there like, is it the full spectrum of the rainbow or is it mostly red and orange? Um, the most dramatics are red, orange, pinks, and purples. Um, and they're, the majority of them are transparent colors, uh, not opaque. Uh, it can happen in others, but to a lesser degree. Uh, it's not as dramatic. And we're now in an age where there is quite a bit of research by manufacturing companies. So you can literally call any of the manufacturers and say, I'm trying to look for something that goes between purple and uh, magenta. And they'll say, oh, you should try XYZ brand. And you know, that knowledge is becoming more and more readily available. Which is great for all of us. I'll make this one a little bit smaller, so less articulation. So you mentioned that you started in metal sculptures and then kind of moved through a few mediums to find your love for glass sculpting. Um, do you, you, and you've mentioned that there's some differences between metalwork and glasswork. Are there any similarities that feel like made it an easier medium for you to get used to working with? Yes, the similarities are primarily in, in the understanding of heat and welding techniques. Uh, so there's a, a lot of crossover, uh, understanding how to join, how to fuse, how to temper uh, materials to warm them to the proper uh, technique. Uh, in casting, it would be more um, mold making. I mean, there is a whole field of study, a massive field of study about glass casters. <clears throat> and there, the process uh, is, is relatively similar especially in the mold making, the preparation of molds, and readying material. We like to say that 85% of good glass casting or casting in general is preparation of the mold. So, like most things, plan the work and work the plan, right? Do you ever use molds for your glass work and sculptures that you do? Um, I do not, no. Everything that I create is done in midair and with a torch. And sometimes it's smaller handheld torches. So for those of you who have seen the, the glass trees, those are, are all done using very small jewelry torches to articulate each one of those branches. Wow.
that's where a lot of the learning curve or self teaching took place too. There were months, and the very first time I created one of those trees, it took me three months, um, just because of the trial and error in maintaining even heating um, to ensure that all of those small branches were articulated because the problem with it is what I call residual heat. If you go to heat something, and I'll demonstrate right here, right? I'm gonna heat these two branches, two small threads. The moment I start to heat this one, it will bend, but I could hold it in place until the one behind it bends. So you have to think about where you're heating, but also what is in the, the kinosphere around it, up, down, side to side, because you will eventually be affecting that. So now again, I'm just going to articulate this one by reducing the amount of oxygen in the flame. It becomes wider, it becomes more yellow. I'm just going to saturate it with heat. We have another question um, from our audience today from Marie. What's the most difficult project that you've worked on? Oh, this is for my, my graduate thesis. Thanks for the question, Marie, first of all. Um, it was a series of life-size tumbleweeds. Uh, they were three feet wide um, and three and a half feet tall, and they sat on four by four containers, four foot by four foot cube containers, each of which contained 70 gallons of water. And so there was a pedestal on the inside so that at the surface of the water, uh, you saw the tumbleweed growing up, but the reflection going into the water. Of course, all of the containers were black and um, it was the most difficult <laughs> in our, we had a shared studio space uh, at RIT in the sculpture department, which was great because you had a fantastic opportunity to see your fellow sculptors and your colleagues. Uh, and I remember in the space that we had, we had no ceilings, it was a giant open air, but we had cubicles, if you will, large cubicles. And so we went away on winter break and I had not thought that my neighbors, who were sculptors as well, stone sculptors, would be working over the break. When a stone sculptor works, they create massive quantities of dust. And in my space, I had left my tumbleweeds. And so I came back and it looked like there was about an inch of snow on each one of the branches. And it had taken me months to, to put them together. And I went uh, to my, my professor who's a graduate assistant, Yusuf Choi, and I said, and it, she, <laughs> in a very delicate way, said, you must take them apart and clean them and put them back together. And I was like, oh, no, 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 <laughs> I can't. Can I take a Q-tip? And she said, you can try, but eventually you must take them apart. And so I had to unfold each one of them, layer upon layer upon layer. What I'm doing now, this is a hollow formed acorn. I've made it previously. And because it contains air on the inside, which is going to be heated as I heat the outside, um, I'm gonna warm it up in the top of the flame. At this level here, it's about a thousand degrees. Uh, and so I can slowly introduce heat to make sure that the outside temperature and the inside temperature of the glass are the same. Now it is open at the end, so air, hot air is going to escape. But if I just put this into the flame, there's a strong likelihood that it would crack. So uh, I don't want to do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to attach the top of the acorn cap to it and shape it. So I think it's pretty warm right now. I'm going to turn up the heat just a little bit, turn up the oxygen. Yeah, it's starting to glow in the end. So 
but that was the, the most difficult. I learned a great deal. <laughs> I swore a lot, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to coil and wrap the this color called blue caramel around the top here. And that's going to allow it to build up. And then once I have a pretty good size, I'll heat it to a ball, flatten it out, and then use a, a graphite tool to shape it. And that blue is also borosilicate glass then? Yeah, that's really important. When we work, um, the glass all has to be the same material. Um, that's primarily to make sure that that compatibility uh, is consistent. It works on the coefficient of expansion and without putting too much of a scientific hat on. Um, it, the primary responsibility is that when the glass is cool, it all cools at the same rate. If you're using different materials, if I was using soda lime glass um, or a leaded crystal or any of the other types of glass with borosilicate, they would have different rates of cooling and that would cause an enormous amount of stress. So I have a cone here. You can see it's hollow on the inside and these shapes here. And now I'm gonna let heat and gravity pull that all together until it makes a ball. So back to the coefficient of expansion, it's critical that if you're using soda lime glass, you're only using soda lime glass for the whole thing, or if you're using borosilicate. It can be glued together with UV glue or elements of uh, other commercial products called textile, and those would allow the two in a non-heat environment to be formed together. So it, it can happen, but the majority of artists that I know will use one, or the other. When might you use soda lime glass? Is it a preference for picking between the two or is it the kind of glass that you might see for glass blowers? Yeah, well, soda lime glass is usually, well it is in fact, the most common glass. Your windshields are made out of it, your windows are made out of it, everything that you see a furnace worker, uh, when you think of a, a gaffer or a glass blower, that's that's all soda lime glass. Uh, and it is the most common. It can also be used in jewelry making. It's produced, there's a, a frite from Murano in Italy. Most of the, the glass beads that you see or glass pendants are made out of it. Um, so soda lime glass is, is super popular. However, when you go to work with it, you must preheat it. And that process is taking a, if this was a soda lime glass or a crete or uh, an Italian glass, I would have to tap it in the flame at the top to gently introduce heat to the glass so it doesn't crack or break, fit and explode. Uh, and then once it, it starts to glow a little bit after that process, I could bring it in and start manipulating and working with it. Uh, if you stop working with it, you must immediately put it in a kiln uh, because it will need to maintain that temperature. And because I am, as I stated, the world's most impatient glassmaker, I don't have any time for any of that. Uh, so I, I, my preference is to work with borosilica. But there are amazing and incredible uh, works that are, are created this way using soda lot glass. This is increasing the heat slightly. Can you go into the, the tray and grab me one more uh, blue caramel? Thank you. We have another question for you, Stephen, from Bonnie, and it's especially relevant. Um, your hand looks very close to the flame right now. She's wondering, do you have ice water or cooling gel to stop if you burn your hand? Um, have you had a burn or are you just miraculously skilled? <laughs> Um, I do not have cooling gel or water. Um, I'm not miraculously skilled. I often, uh, it happens that you do burn yourself. There are those moments when I'm working with, in my studio and I say, there's that familiar smell, what is that? And then I 
then the pain hits and said, oh, that's right, you're on fire. <laughs> it does happen on occasion. But no, again, the oxygen is pushing the heat away at such a, a fast rate that um, it does allow you to, to bring it, your hands relatively close. You say you're not excellently skilled, but I think all of us that are watching uh, would disagree with that statement. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what I've done is I've taken that diet cone and brought it down to a spear. And in just a moment, I'm gonna reheat it and I'm gonna press it on a graphite paddle. And that's gonna flatten it out. And the graphite is great because it will absorb the heat it provides a strong surface, but it doesn't shock the glass. If I were to do this on aluminum or steel or any other surface, it would provide such a quick cooling to the glass. Again, the glass is right now 1700 degrees Fahrenheit, and this is probably 72 degrees, that's the ambient temperature. Uh, but because the graphite will absorb the heat, we're gonna be in good shape. So I wanna make sure I get it warm enough to move. It looks like it is. The critical part is I'm only heating just the top bit, not the walls of the amber acorn. If I heat the walls of the amber acorn, it will collapse on itself. So understanding where that heat is and how it's going to be positioned is pretty critical. So we have a cap. Not a great cap yet, but we're going to take this tool, which is also a graphite paddle, but it's shaped on the end. And so by applying that curve, that angled aspect, I'm going to be able to, to draw a nice tight angle, make it look a little bit more realistic as the cap of an acorn. I want to do this when the glass is hot, so I'm going to keep it very close. Do this several times. Let's give it a little bit more heat. I also don't want to put, apply too much pressure because the support that I'm using is a very thin thread of glass. If I push too much, I will probably break it. So it's a, a strong understanding of heat and time. And this takes a while to, to get there, that understanding. You can see where it's cooling, it's turning the dark color rapidly. Bring that a little closer to you. Now we have a little bit of a little cap. It's still quite warm. I'll bring it back here. How long would you, say it would you say it takes the glass to cool completely before you can touch it after it's been in the flame? So probably a good eight to 10 minutes so you can touch it. You have, with four silicate, you have about three to four seconds once you take it out of the, the heat. After that time, it's becoming too stiff to move. Okay. Give it one more press. So now we're going to build the stem. 
I'm going to keep this relatively warm because when I go to join the stem onto the cap, uh, I want to make sure that the surfaces are again glowing bright red or white hot, which, no, which will allow me to understand that there's a solid seal. It's not going to be one of those cold seals that we talked about where again, if any vibration were to happen, it would completely pop off or crack. <clears throat> So I'm turning the acorn and holding the glass rod in my right hand still. It's going to create that connection point, that little half dome at the top. And we're going to cut it free. It. So our next step is to go ahead and attach it to our branch. Well, for this, we're going to need a little tiny flame, very, very small. I call this a needle flame. So I'm going into my kiln and pulling out my branch that I made previously. See the final one there. It doesn't look very attractive right now. In fact, it looks rather ugly, but <laughs> We're going to make it work. So the first thing I'm going to do is take a look at this, this branch piece and then say, OK, how and where is this going to willow the best? And I think that my acorn stem is a little too long uh, in this process. It looks a little out of proportion with the rest of it. So I'm going to shorten that just a bit. I'm just using some stainless steel tweezers, feeding the glass, and then pulling the thread off to shorten it. The great thing about working here at the studio is my tabletop is aluminum. So if anything falls to the surface, I don't have to worry about that smell that we talked about here. <laughs> OK, so heating up both areas in the flame. and then fusing them together. And you see this piece that dropped? It's cool enough to manipulate and move with my hand. Okay. Only the part that's in the center. That's clearly a don't try this at home move. <laughs> but it will allow you to manipulate it for those three to four seconds. Wow. What I'm looking at now is this loop and trying to understand when that hangs, is it hanging straight up and down? So the orientation of this loop to the acorn, keeping in mind that the leaves will help to balance side to side, but it's all going to hang on that central point. I'm kind of happy with that. I'm going to take away a bit of this support that I was using because I'm going to start to manipulate closer to the torch. And I have found that I have hit this in the path and it causes a little bit of hate and discontent. So <laughs> we're going to avoid that. So now one of the final steps is to take our leaves that we've previously made and to attach them in our various places. So. I'm going to warm them up gently because they could crack at this point. Again, 72 degrees to 1700 degrees is a lot of thermal shock. It's a lot of expansion for any material. So we're going to try to keep, treat it kindly. And so each of these will be added one by one. Fused. And then articulated. And by articulate it, I just mean reshape.
Okay, so I'm going to detach the bottom connection. So we have leaves, branches, and now this bottom piece here is going to be detached. I'm warming up my tweezers. Again, they could be cold um, because I'm going to touch them to hot glass. I want to make sure that I'm not introducing shock or the potential for shock. And now just detaching the main rod. And there you have it. And so these leaves are transparent, the bubble is transparent, and the entirety uh, has been affected by heat and time. Yeah. Wow. Cold, but before it gets a little too cold, because uh, it could crack. We're actually a little ahead of schedule. Does anyone have any questions? Any, any additional questions that I can uh, speak to or assist with? Yeah, please send in your questions. We have about 10 minutes before we'll end our program today. Um, Stephen, that was really awesome. Thank you so much for You're your welcome. demonstration today. You really made it look easy. Uh, I can't believe you just did that within 45 minutes for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, it is a, something I'm incredibly passionate about. I, I study nature a lot, uh, those, those elements of how to articulate, you know, and really asking how are those forms created? How are those connections made? What do those shapes look like? How, and how can I articulate them with some sense of realism, but then a sense that you know, this is not manufactured in a mold. This is, there is an artist's hand. That to me is really important. When I go to museums and I look at paintings, I'm constantly searching for the fingerprint uh, or the, the brush stroke. Or to me, it's important to know that there is a human that created this or had a hand in creating uh, the process. So. I mean, I think what's really cool about your sculptures is you're creating each one by hand in the flame. And I think what's amazing about that process versus using a mold is each piece is so unique and a little bit different. Yeah, that's exactly it. That's, that's really where it has its own life. Because it's, you're constantly required to respond. You know, where is it taking you? Okay. It's, it's a duality. It's a partnership. I don't necessarily say that the, the material has a mind of its own. It isn't. It's an, an inanimate object. But it's a, a progression of stepping stones. We arrived here. Okay, great. That's interesting. Let's, let's see where this path goes. Okay, we'll go here with it. Thanks. What, what information comes from that? Where did, we, where did we evolve in our thought processes? And what happy accidents happened along the way that was like, whoa, <laughs> we're now <Not> here. <laughs> exactly. So and part of that came from uh, the leaf, you know, the turning down the, the temperature for this leaf was a result of taking a cell phone call. And I was like, oh, let me turn the flame down. And I still had it here and I was like talking. And I, Oh my God. So then, of course, one of the benefits of working here at Corning is that we have glass scientists all over the place. So I called my friend Jane Cook and I said, she's the chief scientist. Who was the chief scientist at the time here? And I said, this just happened. What, what happened? And she said, let's do lunch. <laughs> so we had this enormous conversation about temperature and, and oxygen levels. And, uh, and it's, yeah, this is an in incredible, incredible institution where different folks are coming in and they want to all that. Yeah. Well, we have a bunch of questions coming in. So do you mind if I ask them? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So our first question, do you have any new projects that you're working on right now, aside from your acorns for fall? I do. I'm working on a whole series of sculptures that are involving the concept of home and fragility and balance. I'm also, um, because that's where, where I currently am, I, um, I have my home studio in Camillus, which is outside of Syracuse. And then Monday through Friday, I'm here in Corning. And so this work from home, well, where is home? Home is transient, but yet work has to be done. So it, this is very, very interesting to me. So um, it, it's a, a take on one of the sculptures that I have in, on my website. It's a, a home built on a nest, which is on stilts, and the whole thing is tilted, standing on one leg, right? So the sense of imbalance uh, and this understanding of these narratives about home. Another one is a, a series of lighting uh, where I take the trees, but I wrap them in uh, Japanese rice paper uh, and then light them from the inside because I, I, during the whole pandemic, there's this, this tendency of like, okay, we, we, we are going forward, but we don't know where we're going. It's um, what we're going, we're, we know where we are. Those trees are very familiar to me. They represent ladders, transportation up and down. It's, it's, it's a very, uh, it's, it's a known entity. It's almost a uh, part of my personality when you see those trees. I've been working with them for so long, but yet even I don't know where they are now. I don't know where I'm going. I felt and during the pandemic, we were all like, we're home, but this is not normal. This is, and where is the direction? And, and where's the light? Like we can follow the light, but it's, it's shrouded. So those are two areas that I'm experimenting with. That's really uh, cool. Uh, we have another question. Um, do your oxygen and gas gauges have marked numbers so that you know if you're adding more or less, or do you just watch the flame and kind of use visual cues with your um, torch? Now, this is a great question as well, thank you. So the, the regulators are set to 20 pounds of oxygen, and I know if you're a flame worker, that seems like a lot, and eight pounds of propane. After that, it is all by, my understanding, and when I teach, I look at the job that we have to do, Big job, big flame. Small job, small flame. So guiding that you know, is an understanding. And that takes a little bit of time. Uh, it also takes failure, a lot of failure to say, oh, this just dripped off and fell to the table. Why? Well, because Stephen, you have a flame the size of your arm. Of course, it's great, right? So, but it, it does take that self-awareness and that self-discovery. Essentially just sitting in the chair. And we have one more um, so you mentioned how your journey through other mediums to glass. Do you still ever work in other art mediums besides glass? I do. Um, I'm very passionate about paper um, and I am a bookmaker as well. Um, yeah, so making artistic books. I, those are very personal to me. I don't share them, uh, but I do work in, in paper and making the paper is most important. Taking the elements of nature and taking uh, things that are growing in my space. It's that, how do you tie your work to time and place? That's really important to me. So taking elements from my garden or the woods behind my house, incorporating them into the paper and recycling them. I also recycle previous books that I made years ago and move them forward. That's awesome. Well, thanks again for this demonstration today. I'm just going to share my screen so that um, we can share some links about where to find your work and um, also where people can sign up for a class with you this fall. You'll be teaching a class about borosilicate glass and flame working um, online. So if anybody in the audience today would like to join Stephen and learn how to work with the medium we just saw, um, be sure to visit the website that we have listed here and also be sure to support Stephen and his work by visiting his website. Stephen, do you have the acorns that you showed us how you make today? Do you have those on your website for purchase? Yes, I do. It's on the shop tab. Awesome, awesome. So if you want one of those acorns, you can go purchase one from his website. Um, and then of course, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, this was our first virtual event for the Clothesline Online Festival that we have all week. So be sure to visit our um, event hub here at clothesline.rochester.edu. Um, programs like today are made possible thanks to all of you. So thank you for supporting us with your membership. 
Um, if you'd like to donate to the festival, m and Bank is doing a one-to-one -one matching challenge for every donation that you make during the week of Clothesline. Um, we'll also be doing a Visitor's Choice Merit Award, um, which you can uh, nominate an artist from our 2020 artists by visiting our hub. Um, and we'll be sharing this recording um, after today ends. So if you want to watch again or um, share with your friends, uh, that'll be available soon. Um, so yeah, thank you everybody for joining us today and um, happy weekend. Thank you, Steven. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye everyone.